Welcome, everyone. This is recording already as well. So uh, we're going to get starting with uh, today's workshop, Democratizing Data and Mobilizing Knowledge for Community Action. Uh, we're going to introduce ourselves and um, the land acknowledgement to start with. So uh, I'm Kim Ricard, I'm an assistant professor at Simon Fraser University's Faculty of Health Sciences and a Michael Smith scholar. Um, and I am joining from the traditional territories of the Songhees here on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. And uh, great to be here uh, with you folks. I am Robert Ortiz Nunez. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I want to recognize the lands on which I stand today, Teotake, also known as Montreal, the traditional territories of the Kanyinkehaka peoples. I am currently the Knowledge Mobilization Advisor at the University of Ottawa but I have worked in the past as a consultant with CBRC, as well as um, I was the executive director of Max Ottawa and the research and development officer at Réseau in Montreal. So I've had to write a lot of funding applications and I actually love writing funding applications if there's such a thing. So I'm happy to be here today. We were hoping this is gonna be a very hands-on uh, practical um, workshop. We're hoping that you leave having learned some uh, very practical things on how to use R stats, but as well as some uh, tips on how to do use this data to get the resources that you need for your communities. So the agenda that we're proposing for the day, we're going to start with some context on the um, and some realities around activism and funding in Canada. Um, we're we want to have some discussions, but we're figuring out with the uh, admins uh, if we can have breakout groups. Otherwise, we're going to have to figure it out with the um, um, question and answers. And we can actually uh, allow you to talk at least. I don't know. We don't know if the videos, your videos will work, but you can uh, also participate through audio. So we would love to hear from you because the idea is as well to um, um kind of do collective learning because you all have a lot of experiences we're sure that we can learn from and everyone else can learn. So the idea is to uh, everyone share uh, the things that have worked and the challenges that we've faced um, in the past or currently. Um, then we'll talk about sex now, the context and the methodology, um, our stats, what it is and how to use it. We're gonna have a bit more discussion. Then we're gonna talk about how to mobilize data for the benefit of our communities. Uh, particularly about around some strategies of um, reactive and uh, proactive uh, activism and some tips on writing grants. And then uh, we're going to have Ben Klassen, who is the SexNow uh, manager, and who's going to talk whenever uh, um, our stats is not enough, what you can do, how you can contact Ben, as well as some other CBRC initiatives that are related to data democratization. And if we still have time, so we'll have some more discussion at the end because uh, we we will give you a link for a resource uh, card, a Google document where there's some links. And you can also contribute to that card because you might also know of other resources that other people can um, use. So let's get going. So, of course, there are many ways of working to improve the health and wellness of two-spirit, queers, and trans communities. Um, activism um, has many definitions and uh, descriptions by different authors, but Anderson and Hare, um, they describe it as the action on behalf of a cause, action that goes beyond what is conventional or routine. And I think our communities know um, how to um, do activism. I think we have to acknowledge and recognize um, a lot of members from our communities that have brought us to where we are here today. The fact that we can have a summit for the health and wellness of our communities is thanks to so many people that have, have um, really done a great uh, and very challenging and difficult work and activism in the streets in very um, challenging conditions socially. Um, because we have to recognize that our communities have been stigmatized, have been criminalized, and have been studied for decades. And while some of our allies have provided us with some support, 
some level of protection, love. Um, we still live in a world where the balance of power has been held by mostly white heteronormative uh, patriarchal systems. So um, we also have to acknowledge that our communities have been ravaged by epidemics from HIV to COVID-19 to MPOX. And as a result, we experience poor health outcomes in almost every um, domain of health. And this is why probably a lot of you here today, um, a lot of us have decided to get involved somehow from different hats that we, we might wear, or we've mobilized uh, to advocate for the, for the health and wellness um, of our communities. So whether that is activism out there in the streets, whether that's advocacy through other venues, whether that's research, there can be many different ways. And because activism has, can have different definitions and different descriptions depending on, on, on authors or perspectives. So really, um, different people often have different ideas of what constitutes activism. Um, and as I was saying today, we can really advocate for our communities wearing different hats, doing it from different fronts, and all roles, all strategies um, have contributed to where we are. So whether you are today here um, at this workshop, a researcher, um, a student, a community organizer, an artist, a data analyst, a lawyer, a financial planner, um, it doesn't matter. All of the skills that you have can play a role to get what we need for our communities. So really what we want is that today's workshop is useful for any of you that want to use data to advocate as activists, as community organizers, or any other role. Um, given our experience, we'll focus a bit more on uh, community organizations, requesting funding, although we really want to use the discussion time, probably through Q&A, to hear as well from you to do collective learning on other things that have worked, um, mobilizing uh, data to um, get the things that your communities need. And we can also identify together what still is needed and what we would want collectively as uh, support. So hopefully this is what we'll do over the next um, hour and a half. Now, another um, thing that's important to um, mention, and some of you might already know, and one of the reasons why many of us have gotten involved, Kiefer, with our stats, uh, me as well doing some uh, community-based research with partners, is that it usually takes a lot of time for evidence to reach, to translate it to actions. So on average, um, it, it says that it takes 17 years for research evidence to reach clinical practice. So 17 years is a lot of time for us working with communities where the needs are here and now, where we really have to respond. And often, as you might have faced when applying for funding or um, for any kind of support, often they ask for evidence because we want to fund evidence-based interventions. Um, but a lot of the time we cannot wait for for the evidence um, to come out. So that's what um, data democratization and data activism is all about, to like streamlining and making um, those uh, processes faster. Another, um, which is one of the reasons, as our, uh, Kiefer will explain, that our stats exist. Um, another context that is important to uh, mention is that there is a funding freeze for HIV in Canada. This has been for 15 years. And as you know, the cost of living has increased in 15 years. So this means that we get a lot um, less money for the increasing needs of our communities and for people um, living with HIV or at risk um, of HIV. 
also we have to acknowledge that for decades funding for um, our communities particularly for the health of gbt2q guys has come from hiv funding streams so for a lot of time anything that we were able to do around health and wellness or um, particularly guys, GBT2Q guys, was coming from HIV funding streams. Which brings me to this next slide that also CBRC and any other community organizations and community leaders have been for many years buzzing the ears of decision maker, ma makers, letting them know that our lives, our health, our wellness is beyond HIV. We all know the realities and the needs of our communities. We know that there are many uh, different needs around mental health, social health, spiritual health, physical health, sexual health. So it goes beyond HIV. So thanks to many years of, of this work, for the first time, the House of Commons sponsored a study on the health of LGBTQIA2 communities in Canada in 2019. Um, and this was an official multi-party report that was made from 44 briefs submitted mostly by community members that wore different hats, um, researchers, clinicians, um, uh, activists and 33 witnesses that went and presented on behalf of the committee. And this has over 20 recommendations, I think 27-ish, um, from this committee for the federal government for actions to take. So we will talk a bit more of how we can also mobilize and use reports like this to get the resources that our communities need. Now, we're gonna go to our first discussion. And again, sorry that we cannot do uh, breakout groups with um, um, the Zoom um, type that we have right now, but we're let's do it through uh, the Q&A um, and you can either use the chat or please uh, let us know if you wanna uh, talk, we can provide audio. I don't know if we can provide audio to everyone at the same time so that you can just talk. I think you have to request to talk and then we can allow you to talk um, to discuss the following. How can we, how did you, how have you in the past um, or how do you think that we can persuade policy and decision makers and what has worked for you or your community organizations, your collectives, and what has worked for you in the past. So how do you think that we can persuade policy and decision makers and what has worked for you in the past? And I believe I can also make people panelists in case you wanna um, uh, activate your video as well, audio and video. So who wants to share any um, ideas on what has, uh, what do you think we can do to persuade policy and decision makers? Or if you wanna share something that has worked for you in the past? Um, I, I guess I, I will share. Since yes. No one else is talking? Okay. Um, it, so this is a, a what do I think would work approach. Um, yeah. And when I've brought up these, these discussions around folks who are trying to think about these issues, uh, it's very, very old approach, the whole we're the same piece, which doesn't always work well, but how does whatever this particular issue also affect everybody? So how do we develop systems, even though let's say we're developing a, an approach or system of support research for the most marginalized individuals, individuals, how can we make that relevant to the people who are in positions of power? Um, so mm. if I'm trying to, to simplify this in a way, and this isn't a new idea, but um, 
So if we're talking about, let's say, mental health care, mm -hmm. um, and we're talking about eating disorders in men, well, eating disorders in men show up in transgender communities, they show up in gay communities, they show up in a variety of different places. So how do we communicate, hey, let's improve eating disorders and eating disorder training, so that includes all of those populations. We're helping everybody, but we're actually aiming for a specific population. Um, I hope that made sense. Anyways, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Oliver. No, I think, uh, and I think Kiefer will talk a bit about, um, I think it relates a bit to the next couple of slides of how do we bring that to um, to whoever makes decisions into how we will benefit them as well, right? Thank you. Um, Paul, yes, go, go ahead. We cannot hear you yet. I don't know if you've started. We we cannot um, hear Paul. If I can try promoting you to as pan as panelists to see if maybe through audio and video that works. Or maybe you raise your hand by mistake. And yes, as, as Keith is mentioning on the chat, please feel free to use the chat as well uh, to contribute. No, Paul, I cannot hear you, unfortunately. I, um, Kiefer, can you hear Paul? No, okay, yes. No, we cannot hear you. Maybe if you want to use the chat to let us know um, what your thoughts are, as well as anyone else, it would be great to hear from you. Um, while maybe Paul gets the um, mic, the audio working, or um, shares um, some thoughts on the chat, is, is, um, does someone else want to go with audio? I can also make you a uh, panelist for a bit if you wanna go on video. And thanks for everyone joining. It's a great list. I see there's a lot of people that have a um, great experience working with different, um, I, I see some names that I recognize working from uh, different organizations. So it would be great as well if you can share some of your experiences and your challenges, because that will be very useful for other participants. We have maybe time for one more person before we move on. And please feel free to use the chat even while not we're not at a discussion time. You can always use the chat to um, to share some of your thoughts, your lessons learned, your experiences. So I'll read what Paul um, said on the chat. Uh, play the long game. Be persistent. Research. Make connections build relationships, and be out and visible and vocal. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I think those are, um, and we'll talk in the last part of the presentation, how beyond data we have to be visible, be out and about, do networking, make connections, use all of the, um, the resources that we have in all of the fronts, and be persistent. Uh, of course, because a lot of the times it does not work the first time, but if we persist, we'll, we'll, we get there. Um, Keith is also reminding us that if you want to remain anonymous, you can write in the uh, question and answer. So that's great to know. Thanks. Okay, well, the chat's there for you. 
and we'll have a couple other dedicated spaces for um, discussion. So in the meantime, um, I'm going to read the last comment and then we're going to move to um, Kiefer. Um, so Paul's sharing on the chat. Paul says, I work in a public health agency and have had to work hard to make queer issues visible to heteronormative systems. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Paul, for doing that. We need uh, people everywhere. We have to make sure that the gay agenda <laughs> uh, gets through different spaces. So yes, it's through 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 many di wearing different hats and uh, through different roles uh, and spaces that we can um, move um, and get our needs um, heard. Okay, so Kiefer, um, to you. Yeah, thanks. I, I thought the points I raised. Sorry about the uh, you know the room's not working out, but I think I think all of us have that shared experience of like trying to be listened to and heard, and not feeling like we can be heard, and then are trying to have to be either positively deviant, you know, finding ways to make the system work for you, or or that sort of thing. But part of this has to come down. And on the next slide, we'll, we discuss a study we did looking at public health interventions. <coughs> sorry that people in Canada prefer to fund. And so we used a discrete choice experiment. Um, so simply we presented people choices and asked them to choose between two hypothetical programs. And we described these programs by what disease or health issue they addressed. So you can see here in the figure, uh, you know, to prevent cancer, diabetes, drug overdoses, heart disease, mental health problems sexually transmitted infections, cancer, and then whether we were preventing or treating those conditions. And then we um, said how many years would be gained to the life of those participants in there. And we randomized the responses there from one to 10. And then we addressed which populations uh, the, these two hypothetical programs were serving. So are they serving the general population? Are they serving queer people, people who use drugs? And uh, basically we took those and each of the two, two options were randomized. So what people presented was completely random based on, you know, um, based on these lists. And so a person may have got a intervention that says it's designed to treat cancer and it's six year, it adds six years of life expectancy and it's targeted to people living with HIV. Or, it would, and then the alternative program might be something like, you know, to treat sexually transmitted infections targeted towards youth and young adults, and it will add like one year to their life. And so um, with those options, people simply made choice and they did this eight times. And this resulted in about 23,000 exercises as our data set. And we got to look amongst 303,000 participants what, what they chose when they were presented with two options. And we got to model the effects of how those were chosen. And so on the next slide, we show um, some results of that. Uh, and, and the first are to do with just kind of the basic things. We, we saw that people, of course, as you gain more years of life on an intervention, people are more likely so, to select that intervention. People, it seems, sort of have a utilitarian model of addressing health. They, they, they say, if you can add life, if you have an effective intervention, I'm more likely to fund that intervention as opposed to an ineffective one. So that's pretty, I think, obvious. I think all of us kind of share that common ethic of like, yeah, we should fund effective interventions. Um, and, and then we, we also looked at like if whether it was treating uh, a condition or preventing a condition. Obviously, in HIV, this is really relevant because funding is often split down the line against like preventing HIV or treating HIV and, and addressing it. And, and we know from the way that policymakers make these decisions that sometimes uh, that can be helpful. Um, but we see that, for example, people tend to prefer to treat uh, conditions as opposed to preventing them, um, which is, which is uh, you know, interesting, particularly when we know that oftentimes prevention is more effective in terms of uh, cost and reducing the years of life loss. But obviously we need both. And so uh, on the next slide, we start to look at, okay, what about the populations and diseases that we're looking at? And you see, this is where stigma really starts to play a role. And I think that's the reason we have to do activism. And whether that's activism going out into the streets with signs or lobbying a city councilor or uh, talking to your, making a relationship with your health, uh, health officials, 
or using data to advocate for your community's needs by identifying uh, the problems that you face. That sort of activism has to exist to overcome the stigma that contributes to both the health and health directly, uh, but also via the lack of health systems responses. Somebody said the heteronormative systems that really don't take into account our concerns. And so uh, predictably, I guess, you can see things like heart disease, diabetes, cancer. Those were the interventions that people were most likely want to fund. When you start to get to things like sexually transmitted infections or other things that are known to be driven by behavior, people were less likely to support it. And of course, is where we know stigma really starts to attack people is on identity. And you can see in this graph, we've got along the bottom axis, the years of life gained. And so we already showed you that for each, uh, you know, one year increase in life gained of a hypothetical program, people were 15% more likely to select that. But when you stratify that by the populations that they're serving, you can see that people are most likely to prefer those interventions tailored to the general population, then youth and young adults, who are, of course, a sympathetic group, because we've all been youth and young adults, indigenous people, seniors. But if you go all the way down to the bottom, you have gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men and transgender people. Queer people are the groups who people were less likely wanting to develop tailored and targeted interventions for. And so I think that's really important because while people may recognize things like HIV and STIs and mental health disorders as being common, they may not recognize that those things have chronic health effects. And that's why one of the research areas that the CBRC has expanded on with, the, with the, my health research is, is into the effects of chronic health. However, there was one important, um, I guess, uh, qualification to this finding. And on the next slide, we highlight this as being when people were aware of those health disparities. You know, when, when, for example, the link between STIs and gay and bisexual men, people were more likely to want to fund those interventions against comparator interventions. And so when the general public has a good understanding of the disparities that, we, that our communities face, then they're more likely to endorse those interventions. And so in this example, STI interventions tailored for gay and bisexual men were given an edge in that head-to-head -head comparison of this discrete choice experiment. And I think this is important uh, for us to consider and to recognize that the general public, having allies in the general public who know the disparities that we face, um, who, and also having those allies in government who know the disparities we face is really critical because it ensures that people can, can, can ally with us on those things. Of course, one thing that we know sometimes, whether they're allies or not, that one of the difficulties that politicians often face is they can be a bit cowardly, right? So you also have to give them courage to do. And I think that's one of the big reasons that I like to do research is because I think research can arm people with courage to move forward with a policy proposal that does address the fundamental disparities that our communities face. And I think research like our stats and that done by the CBRC and all across our community that highlights disparities. Sometimes I think it can be felt as, oh, you know, our research is really deficit based. But I think of it as an opportunity to show researchers, uh, uh, for researchers to show the, the uh, policy and decision makers and the general public that funding for our community is necessary and something we need to advocate for. And of course, data alone isn't going to really address the fundamental issues that our communities face. But I think it's a tool that our community use, can use to advocate for itself. And I think that's one of the great things about the SexNow survey. And on the next slide, we go over some methodology related to the SexNow survey, but I think one of the big principles of SexNow is that we strive to engage our community and that we try to put community first, both in the collection of the data, in prioritizing the voices of our community in terms of being represented in the data, and then also shaping what information is collected. And so each year there's an extensive kind of process that we go through to try to make sure that the questions we ask and the things we look at are representative of sort of the needs and, and thoughts of the community. On the next slide, we talk about the RStats platform, which is mostly you know, what I'm here to talk about today. I created RStats a few years ago, I think in 2019, as part of my uh, CHR, um, health Systems Impact Fellowship and partnering between University of Victoria and the Community Based Research Center, we thought arming the community, matching our values in the way that we conduct research to the values we do in terms of data, seemed to be a really big priority. And so we wanted to democratize that data. 
We didn't want, and CBRC has never wanted, SexNow to be a data collection tool that is kind of held and controlled by researchers. In fact, I'm pretty sure that like the first like university appointed PA principal investigator of SexNow was Nate Lachowski at UVic. But prior to that point, it was always members of the community who are leading and uh, delivering this study, not academic researchers. And so, but one of the challenges was is putting that data into people's hands was quite a difficult challenge because A, the data is sensitive, right? We're talking about people's very intimate, personal experiences um, for a population that has faced stigma and discrimination for their sexuality, for their identity. And so we want to make sure that the way we release this data is done in a way that protects people's privacy but we also wanted to make sure that anyone could access and that you don't have to wait for a researcher to take interest in your topic for you to be able to go and advocate on the data that we collect, right? We shouldn't have to wait for things to be published in academic publishing schemes. We should be able to find the data and go and activate it itself. And so that was really the intention between, behind our stats is try to make that data more accessible for programs like the CBRC Investigators Program, for community organizations who were developing grants and advocating for that. And so you can see on uh, the next slide, we talk about CBRC's methodology and trying to really maximize the way that this is used in terms of, I see that there's an issue with this slide, but in terms of our really cross national network, um, I think if you click the other tab. And so, um, uh, yeah, sorry, it must have been a link hidden on that page or something. Um, but in, in terms of the cross-national network that we're working with, we want data to not just be used by the CBRC, but to be used by all of our many partners across the country who make the data collection possible. It would not be a successful research program if we did not have this kind of broad national involvement. And I don't even think all the organizations, I should have went through and, and made sure we had an updated list. I think this was maybe the 2019 data. Uh, collection uh, organizations that were involved. But every year we expand and increase uh, who's involved. Um, so uh, so to do this, to create this platform, we leveraged, and on the next slide we just show, um, we kind of leveraged this integration of the Advance Alliance, which is kind of the national network of organizations, SexNow, which is uh, CBRC's uh, survey platform, and uh, a, a, a software called Tableau. And of course, maybe many of you have become uh, aware of Tableau maybe since COVID because these sort of data visualization dashboards have really taken off since then. But, um, but using Tableau and those existing data sources, we wanted to create a product that would be really useful. And on the next slide, we also show that we wanted it to be grounded in our grow and lift framework that, that really valued um, from the ground up communities involvement and practice. And so uh, working with them, we decided what indicators would be in the R stats dashboard, how those indicators would be presented, what options people would be able to use, how privacy would be uh, protected. And so all of those decisions were made kind of in consultation uh, with community. Um, and so um, looking at um, how people have used R stats on the next slide, you know, people um, really have been able to flesh out from this platform understanding about their communities. And so one of this, this happened maybe I don't know, a year and a half ago. Uh, but, you know, one of our community partners was looking at intimate partner violence and they used our stats to kind of look at this issue. So we kind of wanted to walk you through using kind of um, this example of the R stats dashboard about how you can really use it to understand. And so if you go to cbrc.net and go to R stats, I think that's uh, still the website. I should have probably checked uh, beforehand. Um, but I can maybe throw this in the chat. Oh, why didn't it work? Yeah. Um, there's both a tutorial and then there's how the dashboard works. Um, but you can actually go and visit the dashboard. It's, it's live. This is basically what it looks like. You've got a map uh, up top. You've got some line charts, some bar charts, and then all the options and display settings along the left-hand side. So you go to that website. And on the next slide, we show um, the first kind of option. The first thing that you can do um, can you click next slide, um, is, is select the variable that you're looking at. And so if you're on there, there's a long list of variables. We tried to capture uh, a set of indicators that both reflected um, the common indicators that are used to advocate for our community. So there are things like sexual behaviors. There are things like um, uh, you know, mental health indicators, community connectedness indicators, 
uh, violence and discrimination indicators. Uh, and so we, you're allowed to kind of choose the variable that you want to display. Uh, on the next slide, we show that you can also, um, yeah, maybe use the arrow keys because it seems like something is uh, clicky on these slides. <laughs> I don't know what that's about. Um, so in this example, we're choosing intimate partner violence to try to look at the um, you know, drop down menu. So like you can, like I said, you can see kind of these dozens of variables here. Uh, on the next slide, then whatever you select from that box will then be changed and will appear in these, these maps or the timeline or the bar chart. So the bar chart just simply shows you a breakout of the answer responses. All of these variables are dichotomized as yes versus no. And so, you know, did they have intimate partner violence or did they not? Um, and then the, the, uh, the map shows you geographically, you can actually change the map from um, looking at maybe uh, uh, health regions or provinces. And then there's a timeline to show you how that has changed over time. So something we see in our data is that the risk of intimate partner violence has increased. Something important to take note about our stats and the kind of data that we are collecting is we capture multiple things. One, there's been changing involvement in recruitment. Who decides to participate in online surveys does change over time. So some of the effect may be due to, uh, you know, our efforts to increase diversity. That's certainly been a huge challenge with, uh, with Sex Now and other online surveys is ensuring we have diverse representation. Our community partners play an important role in helping sure that we get a diverse uh, 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 community to participate in the survey. And so over time, we have diversified the sample a bit better, but also like this basically doubling in terms of the level of intimate partner violence shows you that, you know, people can also be more willing to uh, elicit that information. Um, and so there's lots of different reasons stuff can change, but this gives you a level sense of like, oh, this is maybe a bigger issue in our community than it once was, and therefore is worthy of deeper investigation. And I think that's really the purpose of sex now is to kind of give you a backbone research project to understand what are the you know, what are the issues in our community that we want to explore deeper? And maybe we want to collect some local data to kind of, you know, add. But this hopefully will point you on the right direction. On the next slide, you can also see that we allow you to, um, you know, hover over the different response options. And it gives you a plain language interpretation. Not everybody's great with stats. You know, I teach a lot of students in stats courses, and I know that people can be unsettled when they see lots of numbers in front of them. And that's perfectly normal. Um, so we've tried to design in kind of a plain language way. It's not always perfect plain language because, you know, creating algorithms that produce this sort of plain language uh, thing was quite a challenge because Tableau is a limited platform. Um, and because we allow so many dynamic response options, but usually it'll give you a percentage and tell you what the numerator and denominator that that percentage are calculated out of so that you can kind of understand a bit more about what the data is saying without getting, without worrying that you're misinterpreting the data. And so you can hover over and see all those options. On the next slide, um, we uh, you know, highlight various other kind of issues that we can, or various other ways that we can look at the data. So those first two boxes, that's changing the variable displayed and stratifying the variable, but you can also subset the data. So say you wanted to look at, you know, the, the prevalence of, um, you know, intimate partner violence just among those who had, you know, poor mental health. So they had a, you know, a general anxiety disorder or depression. Then you could choose a subset of participants and look at that subset. So you can see just in that population. Or say you wanted to look at, um, you know, the prevalence of mental health uh, challenges amongst in your writing a grant for an indigenous community. So you could subset the survey just to look among indigenous participants. And so that's really critical because we know there's these intersectional health challenges that impact different communities in different ways. And a big survey that captures the whole population doesn't always tell you everything you need to know. And so that's, uh, that's the, the next way that we can kind of use, use the data. You can also subset down just to your province. And so if you just wanna see you know, for Quebec or, or for uh, Newfoundland and Labrador or whatever it is, you can select your province there. You can also look at just, uh, just the specific years of the survey. So there's actually now we have the 2021 and COVID surveys included as well. But, um, uh, you know, so the default is to show all years of data. And so remember, that's going back to 2015. So you might want to look at just more recent years of, of data collection. And, the, and, and so that's shown on the timeline, but maybe you want to see the map, for example, by just those years. And then the last option is just what level of geography. And you can choose to look by health region, 
Um, some of that data gets sparse because we do censor data to protect privacy. We don't always show all the various options that are available. And so um, on the next slide, we talk about like as part of our evaluation of our stats, we talk to uh, communities about the ways that they could use and were using our stats. And I think these are helpful and informative when you are doing these activities to think, oh, maybe I'll go scan our stats and see if it has something that I need. And so that's providing data for grants and funding applications, you know, just enhancing, peppering your, peppering your grant with some statistics that support your arguments is a great way to show people, uh, you know, reviewers and that sort of thing that you know what you're talking about, that you've got the data to back it up, that this isn't your first, you know, this isn't your first time entering into this sphere, that you're like there and ready. Um, uh, you know, gathering the information to inform the development of programs, you know, finding like that stat on intimate partner violence that has doubled in the past six or seven years, like thinking about how we can make sure that that's more of a priority, um, you know, in terms of programs, uh, you look at regional comparisons to figure out your specific health community needs, and also maybe to push forward on a campaign that you issue, you know, if you can tell the general public that there's a, you know, greater risk of, uh, you know, uh, this issue in our community. You know, that's something that can hopefully advance towards and contribute to uh, your community's activism and building. Um, so with that, we kind of have a, a kind of another discussion group. And so hopefully that was an informative kind of breakdown. We will have resources, uh, including videos that show you how to use our stats. There's a tutorial currently on the RStats website um, and a number of ways that can can help you better leverage that tool as one of your uh, tools for advocating for your community. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Roberto. Thanks, Kiefer. So uh, we have a second discussion, but maybe before we move to the discussion, are there any questions um, so far? So please uh, feel free to use the audio uh, feature or the chat in case there are any uh, specific questions. Um, otherwise, now we want to uh, hear from you what challenges have you had when trying to use data? And this is not necessarily if you've tried um, our data or if you wanted to access sex now in the past, but just in general, when it's when when you've needed or wanted to but couldn't maybe uh, use data, what were the challenges that you have faced? And also, as we were um, talking earlier before, how can we be both assets based when we're using data, but recognizing that sometimes that data is intended to highlight health inequities and disparities uh, within our communities? And I see there's maybe a comment or a question at the QA. Um, so this question might be for you, Kiefer. How do you ensure that the release of the data publicly was ethical or with consent of participants slash communities? Yeah, so, um, so the data is never released at an individual level. We don't, for example, allow you to look at an individual's record about their health and well-being. And so uh, that was one of the reasons we released the data via Tableau as opposed to making the data set itself available so that people can't look at one individual and understand. It's also why we apply certain privacy things like you know, reducing that if a few too, too few observations are to be displayed, that it will just block out that data. So you know, if you create a subset that is like, I only wanna look at people who live in this province and are transgender and of this ethnicity, right? Like, eventually you get down to a small enough subset that it blocks it out. Uh, the second thing is just fundamental research protocol is that we do get informed consent for all of our participants. We tell them how their data is going to be used, that it's going to be released in aggregate uh, to the public, um, and, uh, and, and that that will be, you know, part of their participation. And so, um, so I think that's something that's really important and critical for the way that we conduct research. We want to be able to do this sort of thing uh, without having the consent of participants um, to, to have their data reported on in aggregate. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully that answers uh, your question. I think that the uh, other key issue, I think the reason we get you know, such, such large participation in these surveys is because people know that their data 
um, you know, is being used by community organizations. We are, I guess, trusting that this data is used well. And, it, you know, I think uh, Ben will go over a bit of the, our ethics as a community and how we want this data to be used. And, you know, certainly if it were ever used in a way that wasn't uh, uh, agreeable or didn't align with our community values, then we'd speak out against uh, use of data in that way. And so, but, um, you know, to date, that hasn't really been something we've come across, but, you know, certainly is something that could, could happen. With putting this data in there, it is kind of an act of trust in, in the democracy of, uh, of people who know and use our data. Thanks, Kiefer. So what about what are the challenges that you have had when trying to access or trying to use data in the past? So we have a comment on the chat. Thanks, Oliver. Um, Oliver says, challenges, finding data that has identity label subsets and finding data that can be used to show within group variability okay so those are some of the challenges um, i think i think that's one of the strengths of uh sex now i mean that's certainly our sex now can't be used for every research question certainly but one of our big intentions of sex now is with the large sample size you can hopefully look at within group variability that yeah we you know our survey isn't just about one population there are many parts of our community and everybody within our community has different experiences and being able to look at a large enough sample size especially when you're pulling across multiple years for example that allows you to look at some of that within group variability and so i think that's like a key reason this exists but i think that comes at a sacrifice of depth right we can't go into deep into people's life experiences with a tool like this which is really where a lot of that important, uh, find, you know, important work is. And so I think, you know, I just want to add to Oliver's that, yeah, there's both the challenge of like having that within group variability, but also that depth of, of understanding. And I think that's one place that, you know, um, you know, our research program is hopefully evolving to be able to address through sub projects related to CBRC and our stats and sex now. Thanks Kiefer. What about others? What other challenges have you faced? when trying to access or to use data. Or what about this um, challenge of being asset-based when using data that we're actually using to highlight the inequities? And you're all um, permitted to talk, so you just have to unmute yourself if you want to share some of the challenges you have faced. So I see a couple of people that are muted themselves. Go ahead. I remember for me in the past when I, um, for example, beyond um, data, like the one we can get through our stats, but just sometimes accessing recent journal articles. I was not part of any university. I was working for a community-based organization and I wanted to do a literature review to get some recent journal articles or maybe to have some complementary um, qualitative data that would maybe help me explain some of the surveillance data um, and then not having access to databases. So community-based organizations don't always have um, that access, right? So that might be something else to to figure out. Yes, we have a um, go ahead, Kiefer, and then I'll read the question in the chat. Yeah, I think, I mean, just speaking to that, something that like when my partners started working for the government, one of the things I was surprised to learn is that government doesn't have access to journal articles either. They don't subscribe to the library databases. And so I think sometimes one of the roles that community can play is bridging researchers 
like you can reach out to a researcher that you're working with say hey give me this article and then pass that article on to government because it's oftentimes they don't even have access to these databases either and so obviously this is a huge problem in academic publishing and the you know relying on research and institutions is is really troublesome uh, because government pays for this all this research to take place and usually they don't have the data available to them either yeah i didn't know that not even the government so yeah that's definitely a challenge so we have a question on the chat could you please explain asset base more in more detail do you want to go or did you want to answer it or... so as a base is um focusing on the assets so seeing what our strengths are as a community instead of like focusing on um um it's kind of like contrasting a, a victimizing perspective of our communities but we're, when we're bringing these questions, because sometimes when we're applying for funding, because how funding streams work, we have to highlight health inequities and disparities, but sometimes we also wanna um, highlight and recognize that our communities have been uh, strong and resilient for so many years, as, as we saw in some of those images. So it's just how to, how to be assets-based when, the data that we want to use or that we have to use is to highlight those inequities and disparities. Is that more clear, Antonio? Kiefer, did you want to add something? Uh, no, I mean, I'm definitely interested in people's thoughts on this. Yeah. As, a, as a researcher, this is like something that you always struggle with because um, yeah, in order to get people on board, even like our discrete choice experiment research, right? That was a big finding was that you have to get the public to understand the plight of our community if you want them to be sympathetic and support politicians that will fund uh, research. I think like allyship has to be built on kind of that shared experience. And I think finding ways to do that in an asset lens is really critical. It's something I've tried to do in my personal research around uh, chemsex and, uh, you know, sexualized drug use is highlighting that we're not doing this as a deficit, right? It's not a deficit that people are engaged. It's that people are dealing with really hard things in life, just as everyone, everyone deals with hard stuff and that a coping strategy, right? Or this sense of positive deviance or finding a way to leverage that for survival, right? Is something that people are doing when you ask people about why they use things like crystal math, right? It's to cope, it's to find connection, it's to build a community, right? It's to deal with those hard things that are happening to them. And so I think that's like maybe an extreme example, but uh, there's lots of ways that we can take what we're understanding, you know, as deficits and reframing them and helping people understand. And I think there is some utility in doing that in terms of advocating, because I think part of, you know, somebody mentioned earlier as like a way to engage community is to build those connections and to have people uh, feel feel like we're part of their problems as well. And I think people usually interpret their own personal experiences in a positive light, not, not a negative one. And so if you take something like condom use, right? For decades, condom use has been like this kind of vilified. You're not using a condom, you're risking HIV, right? There's been a lot of controversy about condoms. But if you realize that people are not using condoms because they're seeking intimacy and connection and like, sexual fulfillment like those are things that are positives and so i think asset based for me means looking at the positive and the real reasons that people are doing things not the stigmatized narratives about why people are doing things and so and that's my one of the things that's helped me kind of guide my work but yeah i'm definitely looking for always looking for ways to take issues and say how can we be more asset based about this um, we have also on the chat been saying to me, it's important to think through how the data is framed. For example, framing negative health outcomes as a result of social determinants, minority stress, etc. So the framing, the lens that we um, that we presented. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Another thing that for me, I think in the past it's sometimes understanding the role or the objective of a funding request, right? That's usually an internal document that's uh, written and submitted to get the thing that you need for the community, which is not, you're not committing to using 
those words, that language, that structure, when you're actually implementing an intervention. Of course, when we're doing things with our community, we, we have a different angle and perspective and lens that actually uh, portrays or expresses um, uh, how we want to see ourselves, how we see ourselves and how we want to see ourselves as a community. Um, so I think understanding that sometimes how we write things on paper are not exactly the things that we are committing to in terms of language, um, of images, of strategies, as when we are um, doing community-facing activities. So I think also understand that um, helps us uh, as well when, when we're, for example, asking for funding. We have another comment on the chat, agreed. I feel like uh, that framing is about contextualizing the situation around the individual. So much of the stigma that disparity focused research can perpetuate inadvertently supports a behavioral choice narrative, yes. Uh, whereas framing the data within context can mitigate that. Thanks, Oliver. So the importance of context, right? Which is why, as well, a, a lot of the data, like our state, our state's data, has to be um, used with caution, and um, you know, it has to be part of a, a larger um, narrative whenever we're using it for whatever uh, purpose. But yes, context is key. Anything else? We have maybe time for one more audio or chat intervention before you continue? I mean, you can continue to use the chat uh, while we move to the next part. Okay, so let's um... Let's keep going. So now, um, and we've started to together explore some things or, or, or um, ideas on how to use data, like the one we can get from our stats or other data for the benefit of our communities. So before we move to a couple of more practical slides, as well as the, um, uh, the resource card that you can that will give you that Google Doc link that you can keep and use and build on to share. We're uh, close to 30 people here today. So, you know, let's see if that is like also a um, kind of community of practice, our support system um, where we can um, provide uh, links or resources uh, that are useful. But before moving there, let's also understand um, some of these concepts that we've had, uh, we started, we've been using today. So data democratization, data activism, we've been uh, sort of defining it a bit, but let's dive a bit more into that. So data democratization is a process of making the data accessible uh, to communities and making it more um, easy uh, to understand, to analyze that data in as, as one of the goals being uh, making decision-making a quicker process. So like, as we were saying, instead of waiting for those 17 years of evidence to transform to action, through data democratization, what we want to do is really make that um, window time a lot shorter. Now, data democratization as well um, talks about a strong governance. And Kiefer was talking about the example, for example, of our start, the importance that this um, data is uh, collected and managed by our communities. So this is not government surveillance data with other objectives. This is really data that is um, where the governance is 
held by our communities. Now, different contexts, different objectives of actors. Um, as well, and there's um, trust antecedents that are important as well. So I think through the years, with the example of our, um, uh, of sex now, more and more people are willing to provide, um, to participate because we know who's gonna be collecting, managing, and using that data. And I think more and more people understand the benefits of the, the power by the numbers or the power in numbers. Now, let's move to the next slide. Now let's talk a bit more about um, data activism. So Doris and Gomez Cruz, they explain that data must be put to work. It has to be mobilized. Like data cannot speak for themselves. Data cannot enact change. Like data on itself, on themselves. So really data is there for us to interpret, to mobilize, to bring it to whoever we wanna present that data. And then we go beyond data activism to more like the word activism, which comes from the Latin word actus, which is an action, a doing, a force. So this comes from uh, Cinnamon. Um, so it's really understanding activism as grassroots, like communities, actors that are capable of making social change, social and political change. And data activism, so going back to that concept with data, it's about the less powerful gaining um, agency by using uh, data and data infrastructure as well. And of course, there's um, different literature um, talking and describing um, data activism, and it can go into like really the big data hacking um, activism or open source um, type of activism. But I personally am nowhere close being a, a data and a big data analyst, uh, but more like a community organis uh, organizer. So we're talking as well more of a larger, broader understanding of, of data activism as using the data for our advocacy purposes. And when we're thinking about data activism, it's as well as seeing data as one of the key agents for social change. So again, this idea that cinema brings about power in numbers and power and numbers. Now, this also provides a way of thinking about the relative force of data, because again, data on itself, it doesn't have force, we have to use our agency to give force to the data. So it's deployed, uh, it's deployed by us, um, community leaders, community organizations, and sometimes the value of strategically collaborating with allies, allies that could be decision makers or policy makers. Now, as we were saying, this, um, the idea of data activism is also about the autonomy in collecting and managing data. So meaning we do not wanna wait for surveillance information about us collected by others to use this data, which could be seen about as react reactive data activism. So we're like reacting, we're waiting for others to do it compared to more proactive data activism, like collected by our own communities. Sex now being a not one example, but there are many examples, like many community-based research projects, um, participatory um, action research. Those are the kinds of examples as well, when we establish those partnerships with academic allies, for example, to collect the data that we need. And this, using this agency, is what it's referred um, by others as proactive data activism. 
And on the next um, a couple, in one slide or two, we're going to see a table showing some of these strategies um, that we can use both reactive data activism strategies and proactive data activism strategies. But then there's the third, uh, the last point on the slide, gentle data activism by Cinnamon, um, who describes gentle activism as a collaborative tactic with policy actors which is different to maybe an appro approach that is more militant kind of activism, activism or data activism. So for Cinnamon, gentle is really about a careful, consciously planned and moderated um, and very strategic way of um, thinking actions in order to advance specific activist goals within those decision-making circles. So um, that's one of the words of Cinnamon saying, gentle modes of action may be highly appropriate for goals, such as influencing policies that affect marginalized communities, but gentleness may not be suitable for challenging the injustices at the root of marginalization. So thinking as well of gentle data activism and other approaches to activism and data activism as complementary. Because gentleness here, Cinnamon understands as um, a consciously and um, strategic uh, way of action, but Cinnamon also reminds us that it could also be seen or understood as a process that could reinforce power imbalances for sometimes minimal, minimal short-term ter gains. So Cinnamon proposes for us as activists when we're making decisions to really weigh the benefits of advancing our key goals against the potential risks of damaging um, some normative um, aims of some of the more grassroots movements. But again, we can really see gentle activism and more militant type activism as being complementary. And we could think that, and I think we maybe a lot of us here know people that are in one or the other strategy or that, or that move back and forth uh, with both strategies, because I believe that's how we have um, been moving forward. And we have a comment on, on the chat saying, guillotine them with gentleness. Thank you. That's uh, another uh, um, good description for this. Thank you. So let's move to the next slide. And this is certainly not exhaustive at all, um, but these kind of help us a bit to um, understand and see, thinking about how are we always using reactive data activism strategies or have we also tried proactive data activism strategies? And as people were saying also earlier in the chat, it takes um, patience and being persistent because particularly proactive strategies are not um, magic. They, they, they don't transform into what we need or what we want in the moment. So for example, some examples of reactive strategies would be applying, applying for funds from call for proposals, right? They're within a framework, they're released in certain times, sometimes we have to wait three, five years for the next round. So that's waiting for that, fitting into the framework and then applying for funds and waiting to see if we get any. Um, there could be participation in consultations whenever we're given the chance, whenever decision or policymakers are organizing consultations. And we um, provide the feedback when we request it, or maybe we attend something and then we're asked for feedback, um, as, as well attending meetings when we are invited, participating in research projects when we are approached as community members, and submitting our funding reports, right? Those are some strategies that we might be using, that they're all important, but that might be reactive. But we can maybe also think about 
activism and data activism as maybe using more proactive strategies. So maybe requ request funds at any time. If there's, there's some needs, let's knock on the doors of the different levels of government, municipal, provincial, uh, or territorial, and uh, federal. Go and talk to our representatives, prepare. Let's use our stats or, or some other data to build a case and then knock their doors and ask for a meeting and then really present what are the needs of our communities. So not waiting three or five years or two years whenever those uh, call for proposals frameworks um, work. Now we can also express our needs and present data through different uh, channels, um, through meetings. These can be also the more militant um, aspects of, of activism. It can be through networking. Also in the chat, it was saying uh, earlier how important it is to be out and about and be going to events uh, where we might run um, to partners, where we might run to funders, to policymakers, decision makers, researchers, really by networking. And I think it's to Kiefer's point as well, because then through that um, work of really um, educating people of the, the importance or um, the context and the realities of our communities, then they'll understand it better and be more likely to fund um, um, our projects when we present them. Because also, let's admit it, sometimes they have like lots of funding applications to review. There are lots of pages. So oh, it's not always the best space to um, educate decision makers. So we have to think about other spaces so that whoever is a reviewer at any given point Hopefully, when they get our funding applications, they are they have already gone through that process, so that as in Kiefer's um, research project, they they got into a point where by understanding it, they're going to be more likely uh, to fund the projects that our communities need. Again, asking to be around the table or asking who from our communities are around the table, making sure that our voices are around as reviewers, as uh, round tables, as um, as um, advisory committees. Partnerships are also key, whether that is uh, with researchers to evaluate our interventions, to create, to develop new research projects, but it could be as well because power is uh, by the numbers, as we were saying, not only in terms of data, but also sometimes, and I think that's been one of the successes, for example, of advance the uh, Pan-Canadian Alliance is that it's always more, um, it's harder for funders to um, reject or um, avoid or turn a blind side when there are several uh, individuals or community organizations partnering together and bringing a point forward or a proposal forward. So partnerships are important and also as well, you know, that it's, it's a reminder that we are not alone as activists and that we can be doing a lot of the work uh, together and delegating. And um, approaching academic partners on your own, you have a research idea, we can, don't wait, you can go on and knock to research partners in your communities or nearby and see if there are partnerships there that can be also explored. And communicate your successes through other channels than only funding reports. So social media, your website, blogs, newsletters, uh, presenting in conference where there will be uh, decision or policymakers. So making sure that you are finding ways constantly and not every two or five years to communicate what your successes are, what your challenges are as well, so that, you're, um, that the people around us, allies and decision makers are constantly uh, aware of what those are. And I see the time is going. So, I think we're going to share some of this, so I'm not going to go um, in detail to through in um, some of these tips, but these are some quick tips for writing your proposal. Um, and yeah, happy to exchange um, in person separately, but I want to invite now a uh, Ben who's here with us. Uh, because Ben is the manager of Sex Now. And uh, Ben's going to give us some updates on CBRC initiatives. And um, Kiefer, do, do the slides are up after here or, or do you have to share it yourself? 
Uh, they should be. They should They're be here? in here. So okay. you should be able to just go next. We'll I'll skip this part. Oh. Oh, I think I'll stop sharing and share again because I might. It might have only loaded my older version. Yeah, I think that's probably what happened. Okay. Because they're in there on the drive. I'm going to be able to turn my audio on. Um, or sorry, I have my audio on, but I don't know if my video, my video is not starting for some reason. So um, folks can just listen to my voice. That's fine. Um, and maybe, I'll, I mean, I, I don't need slides necessarily either. So I can just like maybe, I mean, I'm mostly here just to share a little bit about some of the data democratization work that we're doing right now at CBRC uh, and just like flag a few things that are coming up um, so that folks can, you know, have a sense of that. Um, a lot of this work is really tied up, I think, in also some work we've been doing around our research principles as an organization. Um, and, oh yeah, here we go. Great, thank right, you. Thank you. Um, one of those principles is really around access. Um, and so, yeah, these principles are really designed to like uh, kind of inform um, how we do our work at CBRC, uh, but also, so like kind of an internal accountability tool, um, but also for, um, you know, how we have conversations with partners and other stakeholders about our work. Um, and so really what this like, you know, principle around access um, is trying to articulate uh, is, um, you know, the need to put research data into the hands of community members um, in order to make this work impactful, which is, you know, what Roberto uh, and Kipper have already been talking about. Um, and sometimes this also requires, um, you know, building capacity in community to actually take this work on. Um, so certainly our stats is a big part of this process uh, around improving access to our data at CBRC. Um, but there's a variety of other activities uh, taking place at CBRC as well that I just wanted to mention briefly. Um, one small example too uh, is that most of our surveys are available publicly on our website, uh, although we're just a little bit behind on the last couple surveys. So hopefully we'll have those online um, soon. Um, one piece uh, is uh, this kind of new R stats training curriculum that we're developing, um, which will include like a pretty detailed walkthrough of all of the features associated with R stats, um, plus three case studies uh, to show um, you know how to use the platform in depth. Um, and Sex Now 2022 data will also be coming to R stats in the coming months as well, which is quite exciting because uh, it'll be uh, only the second in-person sample we've collected. So it'll allow for some, um, or at least second in-person sample that's actually on R stats. Um, so we'll allow for some comparison with our 2018 data, which is uh, really cool. Um, and if folks have any questions about R stats, you're very welcome to get in touch with me. Um, in terms of some of the other data democratization initiatives, there will be some more data dashboard work happening soon, uh, including around the R Health study, which was this broader uh, 2S LGBTQ plus um, kind of health study. Um, and so that dashboard will really be focused on um, some COVID-19 and chronic health data. Um, so speaking to some of the gaps that uh, Kepper mentioned earlier, um, we're also like continuing to do a lot of KTE around all of our research projects. Um, so this is just another way of getting key findings into the hands of community members. Um, and so like, for example, we've done some recent reports around uh, substance use and MPOX using SexNow data. A um, couple other things that I'll just mention really briefly. Um, there's also um, a community-based research training curriculum that's being developed um, and should be online also in the coming months. Um, and that's really focused on, you know, what community-based research is, why it's important, and then some, you know, basic concepts in quantitative and qualitative research and in knowledge translation and mobilization. Um, so again, this is kind of like, you know, related to that capacity building piece around data democratization. And we also run this investigators program across six cities. Um, and uh, that program, uh, there's also a two-spirit uh, program that's currently being developed. Um, so we can head to the next slide. This is just uh, some recent examples of some KTE work we've been doing. Uh, so uh, just, you know, kind of condensing some of the main findings that we're uh, generating from some of the research that we're doing and, you know, putting that into plain language um, and really just highlighting, um, you know, some of the pieces that we really feel that, you know, community members um, need to know about some of these issues. Uh, and I think we can move to the last slide, which is just to say that we're also uh, in the midst of creating a public kind of data access procedure, which will be on our website. Um, because not all research questions can be answered using R stats. Not all variables from SexNow, for example, are actually in the dashboard. 
although a lot of really, really important ones are. Uh, and so if you can't answer your question using our stats, um, there, there is a process to uh, get access to our data and also get some support with that analysis if you need it, particularly if you're a community member or uh, from a community organization where you might not have that you know, internal data analysis um, capacity. Um, and so uh, that process will be outlined online very soon. Um, and uh, we'll also ask some questions about you know, what particular types of analysis are being proposed. Um, and it's also kind of like a way for us to you know, ensure that the analyses that are being proposed uh, you know, align with the principle, some of the community-based research principles that we uh, really try to adhere to in our work. Um, so if folks have any uh, questions about data access, um, I'd encourage you to get in touch with my colleague, Naomi Amberber, who's our uh, social epidemiologist, uh, and her uh, email address is on this slide. Yeah, I think that's it for me. So I'll just turn it back over to Kiffer and Roberto. Thanks, Ben. Um, so we have a couple, a few minutes left. Are there any questions for Ben, for Kiefer, for myself? Otherwise, we do have a question as well for all of you. Um, Kiefer already shared the resource list um, on uh, the chat, but we want to know if there there you go, Kiefer posted um, the questions we have for you. What, that, what other resources do you know about? And please feel free to paste them on the resource card. And which maybe resources or supports you wish existed that from what you're hearing in today's presentation or the first look at the card and that you don't see there. So what, what things would be good and useful for our communities? I think it might have to make sharing access like uh then let me it just says anyone with link can be viewer. I think you just need to change that to like suggester or editor. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Editor. Okay. Done. Yeah, and I think just, I mean, one other piece that, you know, as you have feedback on these sort of things, I think, yeah, do, do feel free to reach out. Like there's always, uh, you know, each year our stats gets updated with the new data set. And as these other dashboards like become developed, we're doing a lot of community consultation, I know. Um, so uh, yeah, there's always like opportunities to like improve the way that this is being done. And, and hopefully like, you know, if you have resources to share on how we can better mobilize and leverage data and uh, engage with uh, the broader communities uh, across Canada in which we live. Um, I think it's so really great to hear just people's various uh, ways that they're adapting to their local context and finding ways to thrive. And uh, ho hopefully that can, hopefully we can find more ways to share that. Actually, it's not a bad like idea to try to to try to provide a platform where we can all share the challenges and you know ways that we uh, navigate this. I think we wanted to get more of that with discussion groups, but uh, of course, with the platform we weren't able to. But I, I know definitely we'll we'll try to think of ways to collect that information from you in the future. Thanks, Keeper. So, any other? Um audio or chat participations or questions. I see that people are um, already on the resource card. So again, feel free to add any resources that we might not have, we might not know, or we might have forgotten. So um, that should be like a work in progress document that you can all um, use. You're welcome. So I think if there are no more um, questions, we're three minutes early, we were quite on time. Um, just, um, we have a chat as well. You are welcome to join uh, after this session in the networking room. Vous êtes tous les bienvenus pour la salle de réseautage après cette séance, donc à midi en Pacific. Merci tout le monde. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Kiefer. Yeah, thanks all. <laughs>